I think everyone here will have attended at least one of the previous conversations online. So we'll just do a brief reminder of who, of who we are. So I'm Carol Tullock. Um, I'm Professor of Dress Diaspora and Transnationalism at, um, based at Chelsea here at the University of the Arts London. And I'm also an honorary senior research fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Amy. Thank you, Carol. So, hi, I'm Amy, um, Amy Twigger Holroyd. I'm Associate Professor of Fashion and Sustainability in the School of Art and Design at Nottingham Trent University. Um, and I lead research projects at the intersection of fashion, making, design, and sustainability. Um, so, I'll just give you a quick run through of how things will happen today. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce our panelists. Um, and we're going to start off with a conversation between them that reflects on the earlier online conversations. Um, and we're going to, to run that to about three o'clock um, and then we'll open up to questions from you. So get thinking um, for about half an hour. And then in the final half an hour, we thought that we'd leave some time for discussion on the tables because um, it's so great to have brought you all here to, to, today. Um, and we want you to get a chance to, to talk and meet each other. Um, and at that point, if you want to come and have a go on the amazing stitch table, then you are very welcome. Um, and at four o'clock, we officially finish, um, but we do have some drinks and nibbles for anyone who would like to stay around, um, socialise, enjoy this amazing room, um, and so on. Um, feel free to help yourself to tea and coffee as we go along. Don't be shy, go and, go and help yourself if you need something. Um, and if you need any help with your stitching, if you give a wave, then Mel and Beth will be looking out for you um, and will be very happy to come and help. Um, so yes, again, don't be shy. Um, okay, so first I'll introduce Melanie, who has organized the stitching today. Um, so Melanie Bowles is senior lecturer on BA Textile Design here at Chelsea. Um, she's author of Digital Textile Design and Print Make Wear. Melanie founded and established Stitch School in 2018 to provide inspirational and technical guidance to reconnect to the benefits of embroidery through embroidery kits, workshops, and large-scale embroidery events around the amazing communal embroidery table. And projects and collaborations include Alexander McQueen, Marie Curie, <laughs> V&A Dundee, Trimarchy in Argentina, uh, Dulwich P Picture Gallery, Brixton Tate Library, um, and the Barbican Centre. And Stitch School recently provided bespoke embroidery kits for the Hayward Gallery exhibition, uh, The Woven Child, Louise Bourgeois. So, thank you, Melanie. This is such a treat. <laughs> okay, so to introduce our panellists, so first I will introduce Sequoia. So, Sequoia Barnes. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Sequoia. Hi. Um, so, Dr. Sequoia Barnes is a textile and mixed media artist and design scholar whose work centres around making processes, rituals and modes of fashioning. She deploys research through practice of praxis, often in her explorations of black diasporic symbolisms, storytelling as performance, positioning the creative process as a performance or ritual. Her scholarly work currently explores the fashion designer, Patrick Kelly. And recent artistic practice includes responses to Senga Nengudi, have I said that right? Yep. Sequoia? Is that yeah, right? It. Fruit Market Gallery and Nick Cave at Tramway with the performative works Sew Me a Quilt, Tell You a Story, The Burden I Bear is Heavy, and Gateway, commissioned by the Edinburgh Art Festival. So, hi Sequoia. Hello. So, next I will go to Elaine. You may wave, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Elaine Igo is Senior Lecturer in Textile Design here at Chelsea um, and has taught across undergraduate, postgraduate and doctoral level at the University of Portsmouth and the Royal College of Art. She's made key contributions to the critical theory of textile design in her scholarship and editorial capacities, applying an approach that interrogates the discipline of textiles from within while simultaneously addressing theoretical discourses and wider contexts. In 2021, she published The Amazing Textile Design Theory in the Making with Bloomsbury, a monograph including contributions from international design scholars. So thank you, Elaine. And uh, now, Polly. Hi. <laughs> Good wave, Polly. Um, Polly Leonard is the founder of Selvage, a magazine about the culture of cloth. 
launched in 2004. Has it been that long? It has. It has. That's a long time ago, <laughs> isn't it? Um, to celebrate our cerebral and sensual addiction to cloth, the magazine revolutionised the way textiles are presented and became the world's leading publication in its field. As a continuation of the conversations that start in its pages, Selvage produces a podcast, newsletter, blog, and inspirational Instagram feed. Selvage fairs, tours, and educational experiences extend the opportunities to share knowledge and develop skills. Polly has specialist knowledge and has lectured internationally on all aspects of textiles, and her own practice encompasses weaving, embroidery, and basket making. And we'd also like to thank Polly and Selvage for joining us as a partner for the conversation series. And finally, through process of elimination, we have Claire. <laughs> Claire Wellesley-Smith is an artist, writer and researcher based in Bradford. Her practice includes long-term community-based projects and residencies that use textile making to explore textile heritage. Her soon-to-be-submitted AHRC-funded PhD at the Open University is a multi-site ethnographic research into community resilience through engagement with textile heritage and craft and is, in based, and is based in post-industrial textile areas in West Yorkshire and East Lancashire. Nice. Her most recent book, Resilient Stitch, Wellbeing and Connection in Textile Art, was published by Batsford in 2021. She teaches and lectures internationally. So thank you so much to, to all of you for being here. We're really looking forward to the conversation. And Carol is going to start things off. The first question. Thank you as well. I'm to, to agree uh, with Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so my first question is, what is your response to the concept of the series, the elements chosen for discussion, and did anything stand out for you? Who wants to go first? It's open. I will, I will. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, I loved the concept. I loved its informality. And I felt it was rather like browsing a library where you mm. don't quite yeah. know what you're looking for. And then you find rather unexpected, wonderful things. Right. And one of the interesting things that, that I personally discovered was the connection between the three different conversations. Um, I think it was mentioned in some way in all three conversations, the idea of chaos and calm and that tension between creativity and uh, stitching that brings calm and uh, the conversation about pattern talked a little bit about chaos and calm within pattern making. So that, that was my... My first. Uh... I've got exact almost exactly. <laughs> well, I, I've thought about movement through through the three conversations, and there were um, there was this real real physicality that came across about the kinds of um, decision making and making activities, and and how things gather together and how they settle down, and I, so I, I like that kind of idea of being really quite busy looking yes. for something yeah, yeah. and then finding it and mm. choosing that so yeah kind of a, a distillation of um ideas or uh you know you, you're very you know we all have a very very busy life mm -hmm. uh, even when we sat down at this table um we've t the embroidery has been turned around so what we're looking at i hope you can all see this at the end is the back mm. so we have a bit of chaos, but we see little gems of order and pattern here and there, which are, uh, which are really lovely. And I think it's that tension that, that is, is super exciting. I just wanted to kind of highlight what May Day stands for, and it was making design an agency. And, you know, they're kind of three huge sorts of topics which you've brought together, um, you know, and as I said to you earlier, Carol, this feels like the start of really um, discussions over these three areas. Um, and those three P's, the plain sewing, piecing and pattern, you know, offer the opportunity to kind of invite the kind of chaos and connections. And also in the project description you describe kind of inviting new thinking about connections and disconnections, oh. which I thought was was really, really interesting. What I really liked is actually the, the format of it. So it's described as a series, but 
it was, you know, kind of online conversations where we could see into the homes and studios of those practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, we had the Padlet, which was really interesting with great, really fantastic references. If you haven't seen the Padlet, which is part of May Day, yeah. please have a look at it. I've found that really inspiring myself. Um, and now we have this in-person reflective stitching, um, you know, in an academic institution. So I think kind of having that sort of mixed approach is really exciting and um, generative as well. I think to kind of bounce off of that in terms of like, you know, thinking about restorative and regenerative things, what I found interesting particularly about um, the first one and the second one, piecing, so like this idea of plain stitching and what is plain stitching and why is it called plain stitching was really interesting to me because I think about like why things mean what they mean a lot, like all the time is my research. And so it was really interesting to kind of break that down because that's not something I expected was to like question why is it called that. Um, I really liked that a lot. And I really liked the trajectory into talking about heritage, like who taught you how to sew? Because um, I think a lot of us get asked that a lot and maybe it's like a throwaway where you're kind of like, oh, my mom or my grandma. But actually there's something there about heritage. Um, passing things down or the ritual of passing something down, which is like really important to me. And I think that's, that was a really big takeaway from that was like this idea of like, not necessarily mothers, but the idea of like passing down heritage or passing down a skill, which can be a form of heritage in a way. Um, and then with piecing, I really liked, I can't remember the exact quote, um, but I think it was something, is it Matthew? Yeah. yeah, Matthew said something about repair and piecing, and it like really it hit me in the chest, like, because that's that's like my whole bag, which is the idea of taking things that people are trying to throw away or don't want anymore, um, but were handmade by someone else, particularly quilts, because that's usually the medium that I work in is with quilts and like turning them into something else and trying to figure out how these bits fit together, which is how I work a lot. Um, I'll see an old quilt and I'm like, what is hidden in here? And I'm really interested in like quilts that have marks on them, quilts that aren't good, quilts that have, have been in someone's family for donkey's years and now they don't want it anymore, you know, things like that. And I thought that was really important to think about like how repair and piecing go hand in hand or two sides of the same coin, whereas repair seems more like utility, whereas like piecing seems more like an intention, creative thing, when actually they're both kind of a form of repair or a form of like restoration. And I thought that was really important because it really struck home for me in terms of my own practice. So yeah, I was learning a lot. There was kind of one phrase that came out of, I think it was the piecing conversation, which was, um, or maybe it was Ekta's conversation, a dance with the hands. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, the piecing conversation. Um, and it kind of, yeah, it got me thinking actually about also kind of the tools. So Barbara showed her, um, her mother's um, sewing needles, didn't she? And obviously, you know, uh, Melanie supplied you all with the tools for sewing here, the kind of very fine implements that are used in hand stitching. And it made me think actually about kind of the dance of the hands. Is it more of an, an articulation of the hands? It's an expression. It's a very fine um, movement. You know, as you're all sitting there with a needle between your fingertips, how different does that, does that feel compared to other implements that are designed for your whole hand? So your phones, the cups in front of you. And it's a very fine articulation of the digits. Um, in a very expressive way, which, you know, that, that, that phrase got me thinking, actually, could we describe hand stitching as a sort of proto-digital process? In a sense, sorry, it just got me on one. <laughs> in a sense, you know, the, the um, understanding of that word digital is something which is counterful and quantifiable. Mm. And it suddenly moves what is seen as a kind of craft-led activity 
into something which is quantifiable and digital in kind of in a multiple sense. Um, so I love that expression and it really fired my, my imagination up. I really like the, um, the feeling and really I suppose the discussion around rhythm that came out of all of the conversations um, from this, this, this sort of very personal interior rhythm of hand stitching from the first conversation and then the idea of moving pieces around until you've kind of found a place for them in the second. And then um, the rhythm uh, that Marsha described of uh, choosing choosing mm -hmm. the fabrics that she uses to put together in her um, compositions and um, she she did it in a really visual way in how she described it there was this sense of kind of the movement of that which so I, I really like this kind of yeah the the rhythmic qu quality yeah. of all the conversations and I'm gonna just jump in I, there was the bit it made me really look up when Marcia said about the ironing of the pieces as well. Yeah, and that was yeah. a, sometimes we forget about that practical, or that need to make them pristine. Anyway, I don't know what you yeah. thought, but yeah, yeah the yeah. ironing as well. I, yeah. I could, as she was saying that, I had this, uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of screen-based work lately and um, not, not masses of making. and. I had this really strong desire to, to do some ironing, which <laughs> literally never happens. But the, that idea of the way you choose, I think it's um, something that's really powerful in community practice, mm. is having you know, a table. Well, we've yeah. got this table here. Um, we've got these choices to make about the colors, but you know, a, a table full of scrap fabric and how people choose, choose things, how they go to something. And this is something really, um, there's a lovely agency involved yeah. in it. That's interesting uh, that you brought up ironing, which is almost one of those ways of caring that has almost gone out of fashion a little bit. And the movement, I think, um, involved in mending and darning, which is so big at the moment is a very interesting way of caring not only for another person but for a cloth interestingly some of the cloth that people are darning today doesn't really need darning or won't deteriorate because it's made from a factory produced fiber but people but artists are, and creatives and, and stitchers still want to demonstrate that caring with um with a needle and thread. Um, I was also interested, there was one of the, the quotes about now we have a sewing machine, perhaps hand sewing is going to, is there any need for hand sewing? And I think it's very interesting that there are uh, a few new cutting edge brands who actually use um, hand sewing as a USP, as a way of producing a carbon neutral uh, garment that uses hand sewing, those very old techniques of hand sewn seams as a way of, of presenting a, a very forward looking uh, way of making. So perhaps the needle is the tool for the future, not the tool of the past. Uh, I wonder actually kind of going on from what you said, Polly, and, that, and this is something that um, I wanted to sort of bring to the conversation is obviously, you know, hand stitching is being done all around the world in a production sense, in a manufacturing sense, and, and it, actually people are being exploited for, mm. for yes. yeah. their very fine um, hand stitching, exp you know, expertise. So, you know, it, it's important that as we're reflecting upon stitching as a, a process and a, a method which is often meditative and pleasurable and for, for leisure, that there are, you know, there are many people still are all around the world stitching by hand um, and, you know, for, um, in a very different sense. Right. I agree. Because, like, when I think about hand stitching and particularly with clothes, because like for me, hand stitching is like a connection to um, the past in a way that's kind of always present. Because um, like my grandmother would 
fix all of our stuff by hand. And then she would teach us how to do it because that's how I learned how to sew. And her motto was like, everyone should know how to sew. Because you know, you can't always just buy a new shirt or you can't do this because we didn't have any money. So it was like, you know, you got a hole in your shirt, you fix it. And that was really important. And it became like this, this thing about saving something. So that care is into it, but it was also a necessity. It was part of our lives. Like whenever you had downtime and you broke something or you, miss, you were missing a button, you sat and you fixed it. But then it was also a way to kind of like communicate with each other. So you sat and it was like usually the times that you had those like real conversations, like what are you gonna do with your life? Or, <laughs> you know, what was that thing you said yesterday? How have you been? You know, or like, you know, family stuff that maybe they didn't know how to tell you at the time, but while you're sewing, you know, you find out like the family tea or whatever, you know, um, and passing down stories and, you know, things to continue to pass down. Um, and I think that's a really important aspect to think about with hand sewing, like in a sense of not necessarily the home, but like outside of like production and uh, how to make something fashionable is thinking about like how it actually impacts people's lives, you know, in terms of like what happens when people sew together, like when you talk about the community, and I think that's really important. So yeah, it's just like, you know, hand sewing has so many aspects to it and it affects so many parts of lives and like how we come to it in many different ways. And even the way we do it is different. And that's really interesting. Like when you told me, you can tell a lot about me by the way that I stitch. And I was like, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know that I don't know? <laughs> and yeah, it's just like, I, I really love that about hand sewing. It's like seeing someone through the act of doing it. So like the dancing with the hands, even dancing is like a personal, a very subjective thing. And I really, I really enjoy that about hand stitching is that you can really get to know somebody. Once again, that's how we got to know each other. So it's just like, it's just so important. And I think it's really important to kind of like keep it going forward in that community sense that Claire keeps, you know, keeps bringing up, which is super important to keep doing it together. It's super, super important. Well, I liked, um, I think it's Lin Linda's, Linda's project, uh, the act of care mm -hmm. and the conversation about that and the sort of spaces of community. But I think um, that idea of, uh, of, of care in, in the time that you, you spend maybe mending something or making something. I think there's, there's, there was something in that that was really um, beautiful because she spoke about it being um, a, a lifetime project. And I, and I, I really yeah. like that. It was this kind of commitment to creating spaces of care mm. in, in her work, which obviously isn't currently textile based, but I could see how it applied to lots of textile mm -hmm. kind of processes really. Or like even the idea of like something that's like hand sewn or sewn or stitched and this idea of like something that's over a lifetime and like this idea of like marking someone's life and like literally having a part of you in it that's what I got from that quote. I was just like, wow, the idea of like creating something over your lifetime is like extraordinary. Cause I know stories of people creating like quilts and taking 10 years to do them, which is a feat in itself. But the idea of taking the time and the patience to like make something last over your lifetime is extraordinary. And it got me thinking of like, could I do that? Or like, is it something I should do? And like, what would that be like to either like stitch a bit every day or stitch a bit when you can over your life, you know? Say that's what Claire. That's, yes, Claire's yeah. got a... Maybe Claire, you could tell us a little bit <laughs> about your, your, piece. your well, project. It, yeah, well, I've had a, a, a kind of a daily, almost daily oh. stitching practice for nine, nearly nine years now. So I've got this long, long length of cloth. And I mean, the thing is, it's not, I don't see it as an act of, or maybe it's an act of self-care. Um, 
but it's not it's not a, a useful thing it's not a functional textile yeah. um, but but I find space in my day sometimes a tiny bit of space yeah. to stitch um, because I find it a, a very good way of kind of thinking through right. whatever it is mm. it could be personal things it could be work things as a process of thinking through while stitching which mm. I and again we're back back to that idea of rhythm there's something in that yes, exactly. in that repetition that allows some space for maybe some different kind of thinking yeah. and a way of maybe telling a slightly different story about something as you're doing it uh -huh. um, so I have, have brought it with me if anybody would ha like to have a look later. Yes, <laughs> it's sure extremely would. messy. Carol, <laughs> I'd like to mention something. I remember you telling me at some point along our many conversations oh, along the way. No, it's not bad. <laughs> you told me about imagining stitching. Oh, yeah. Tell so, us about that, because oh, that's God. beautiful. <laughs> Why did I tell you? <laughs> so um, I think a bit what Claire was saying about sometimes the stitching is a bit of self-care or just thinking through the stitching. So I know it's, it's, it's usually happens when I've had a heavy day here at Chelsea and going home on the train and I haven't take, taken any stitching with me and actually need to kind of centre myself and calm down and I stitch in my head. I do the movements in my head and then I calm down but I can actually visualise doing okay. the stitching. I know, it's strange. <laughs> it's strange. It's not strange. I do something similar, maybe a bit more ambitious, is I'll like... <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll do this thing while I'll complete whole fantasy projects in my head, where I'm like, I want to make this insane quilt thing that is also another thing, and then I'm like, literally putting it together in my mind. It's a bit fast paced because in my mind, everything takes like 10 minutes. But it's just like, I do that where I'm like cutting the pattern or even drawing it and then cutting the pattern and then sewing together parts and then making the parts come together and even imagining how it would look on display or how like, what is the most ideal? And I go through this whole process of making it to the point where I'm like, I've done it, so I don't even want to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, I did that thing in my head, so like I'm moving on to the next thing. But it is extraordinary, like it's really soothing. Yeah, and I think it is, I don't know why, it is that mm, rhythm of yeah. the, the needle it's going through. It's the repetitiveness. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I love the contrast of those two scenarios. Though, <laughs> yeah. Because for you, Carol, it does seem like that up, down, yeah. up, yeah. down, gentle, like counting sheep, jump, you know, like so soothing. But then from Sequoia, it's almost like how, you know, it goes to almost to powers of 10, you know, <laughs> from the kind of rhythmic and soothing oh, to... I'm a Virgo moon, and yeah. I'm just really <laughs> ambitious in the mind. In reality, it's a completely different thing. But, like, yeah, I tend to go through whole scenarios because I find it, like, if I have quiet time or I'm just sitting, because I find issue, especially with travel, I'm really, I have a lot of issues with traveling, travel anxiety. And so a way to like self-soothe is to literally like work through creative projects in my head. Cause it's the only thing that like makes me feel like work that is worth it and that uh, feels enriching. So yeah, I'll just go through fantasy projects in my head or like what I want to do with something that I'm working on. And like kind of working through, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, people get it. They know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so you know, it's like you know, trying to figure out how to make it work. Because I prototype a lot with uh, lots of different projects. Because I don't, I want to do it the first time, the right time. Because Virgo Moon. And so I'm like, <laughs> how do I? I'm constantly working through scenarios in my head, like those simulation things. And then sometimes it's like, no, that's not going to work. And then I'm like, literally talking to myself on the train, and people are like looking at me, but they don't know that I'm literally on like a journey. And I think it's really important because by the time I'm done, I'm like where I need to be or where I was going. And like the anxiety is gone. And I've also done work that was like meaningful to me. So like, it's weird, but it gets the job done, but it also kind of saves your brain from like, you know, losing your mind. 
Um, and I've, I can't believe the time already. So it's a quarter to, and we've got, um, we're going to open up to the floor at three. So I want to ask this second question. Um, so do you think these conversations have made a contribution to thinking through, thinking through textiles, textiles practice and textile studies? Absolutely. I particularly liked the uh, PC one because it was two people talking from different, I guess, mediums. I don't want to say backgrounds because they seem like they they really connected in how they do things, but maybe the materials are different. And what I really liked about that is it kind of shows the connections between people and particularly creatives. Because I think, I wouldn't say we're losing that or that you know there's not enough of it because I feel like that's a cliche, but I do want more of it. Because um, I think it's really important to think, for lack of a better word, interdisciplinary. I don't like that word because it's like a, a form word, like a, something you put on like a form for funding or something. But I really like the idea of like people crossing over into each other's spaces and finding inspirations or even going so far as to work together. Because it's really interesting to like step into someone's world and they step into your world and then you find this common ground and then you create like beautiful work. Because like I do that all the time with you know people that I care about and that I work with. A lot of us do different things and we just find like we have the same ideas even though we do different things and then all this beautiful stuff comes out of it that's quite impactful and important simply because it's covering all of these spaces and all of these perspectives all at once. So I think that's really important, particularly for like students um, or young people that are going out into the world and trying to figure out how to connect with, you know, other artists and other people who think like they do, even though they don't do what you do, you know, you can still have like the same values or the same thoughts about process and stuff like that. So I thought that was really important. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say that um, I, I too really like that connection between people who work with different media. Um, and I think sometimes textiles can almost be the, the lesser medium, yeah. uh, which, and putting those, those artists together slightly elevates mm. the textile medium, and which is exactly where it should be. Um, so that, that was all I wanted to add to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like it's opened a door. I feel like this is the start. And because um, as I confess to you all, I'm not particularly a stitcher. But the, you know, the, the terms that you use, and I, I was immediately drawn to pattern. And it was great in that final conversation just on Monday where Jessica and Marcia were talking about the patterned fabrics they select. Marcia particularly was talking about why she chooses to use like the Dutch wax fabrics as a kind of a shorthand for blackness and also the shints for her kind of British upbringing. Um, and, you know, coming from more of a kind of print background, I feel like this almost the same terms could be used to expand and explore kind of other areas of textile practice. Um, uh, you know, I'm really, really interested in um, concepts of pattern. And he had a great um, quote here from Amy Golding about pattern vitiate, vitiates the impact of form and turns thought into ritual. So much to unpack within that one phrase. Um, and it made me think about the, the term apophenia, the human tendency to look for pattern and, mean, and put meaning into pattern as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the future conversations um, on these, these terms. Um, I think it was just uh, so rich in the kind of, um, in the language around processes. And, um, and it, that really, it really struck me um, in, uh, in the conversation with um, Matthew and Linda uh, using Richard Serra's uh, um, dis descriptions and mm. the idea of kind of disarranging things. Um, so I just think that, yeah, that, that, that really, um, di the dialogue around process was just, th there was so much to go back to right. and kind of unpick, pardon the pun, but <laughs> yes, it's, uh, so that, yeah, that language. And I would, I think, 
when uh, Amy and I were starting to think about who we could put together, and we, we did want to have people from different uh, practices associated with textiles um, and when with the plain sewing and I knew that that Barbara Berman was uh, was working on a book on plain sewing and, but, and then I said and then there's Ektar because I was following her on online and it was and I know how Barbara as a historian thinks around textile and she's particularly drawn to not only hand sewing but the sewing machine and she feels that, that you know she's she also advocated that, that she devised an idea for an, a PhD as part of that conversation. But also with Ektar, it's that thing of the mapping, which is almost what was happening through those um, conversations and the maps. And I thought, OK, let's pull these two, put these two together and see where, where we go. So, I mean, so it was always, that was always our plan. I think um, um, Jessica and Marcia may have been a little bit closer, but I, I knew it was the sculptural element of of Marcia that I thought was quite interesting, but I didn't realise until we had the preliminary conversations that Jessica actually started out as a sculptor artist and trained as a sculptor and then moved into textiles. I had no idea, so mm. they had that in common. I really in liked common. how Marcia was bringing in her stone carving. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, what an interesting like, combination and, and different practices to be able to to draw on and refer to and have that like absolute obvious like insider knowledge of yeah exactly lovely. and any more on that any more to add i i don't know why but kind of from the the three discussions um it reminded me of um adam curtis's work and um kind of more recently can't get you out of my head and he talks a lot about kind of pattern fragments piecing as a filmmaker and how kind of through those actions of piecing a pattern that that he's sort of assembling and summoning complexity um, and that also by kind of going through that process and inferring meaning he's causing chaos he's causing these kinds of conspiracy theories to be generated um, and he he kind of uses the fact that he's um, been inspired by this phrase, time and propinquity, prop sorry, I can't pronounce it, basically means proximity. And it made me think about actually, you know, how, again, going back to the selection of, of, of materials that are used, the time element that we talked about in terms of care, and also the kind of working across disciplines and how these are processes that are used in such a wide range of creative practices. Um, both as a way of making sense, but also inviting the opportunity to imagine, um, which has kind of come through lots of the points of discussion that we've had today as well. As a, a final thought um, from me that came across in uh, mostly uh, the piecing, but, but possibly also all of the conversations, was this idea of, um, and in one of the, the quotes, which was, taken from the catalogue of the Borough exhibition that was at Somerset House maybe three or four years ago, about, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, or at least uh, Sequoia did, about continuity of time. Um, and there's a little bit of controversy about should people be cutting up quilts? And Jessica touched on that a little bit. Um, but I think uh, each generation adds something new to the story and the story goes on and the quilts or the whatever it is morph into something else and the layers and layers and layers are built on top of each other. And I think that gives you, at the end of the day, a more interesting story. Yeah. I think that's lovely, Polly, because um, it was something that Jessica said, because she said, you know, it's a conversation we perhaps should have about whether we should be cutting into cults or not. But what you're saying now is that add continuity of time and adding on top. Um, Jessica was also talking about when you do cut in, see those l hidden yes, patterns. Yes, and I yep. really love that stuck with me. And that's a way that you could say that adding is adding new pattern, if you like, and then these new layers. And I there. think if you, if you look back, um, you know, into history, into the 18th century, no one would have worried about cutting up a quilt because they would have been adding something else. They would have had to cut up a quilt to make something new that, that was necessary. I think mm. also in a historical sense, 
textiles were made to be worn out, to wa yeah. be worn down. And so, you know, it's essentially they will be destroyed by human yeah. use. Yeah. And so yeah, this is a creative intervention as part of that natural kind of cycle, isn't it? Yeah, and as like somebody who does cut up quilts for a living, <laughs> um, what I find, you know, <laughs> what I find, I like I go through that process of like thinking about what it was and that in really influences what it becomes after I get a hold of it. Um, particularly because I'm really interested in like hand sewn quilts from people's families um, and just seeing the hand of like a mother or a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle or a sibling sewing something together, just like family things that I guess they decide to let go of for whatever reason. And like the really special nature of like getting a hold of something like that and like reconstructing something with care. Um, Cause it's not simply ripping up a quilt. Cause really I look at the pattern of the quilt that I get and I'm like, what could this be? Like trying to keep the essence of what was there, but into this new thing that I'm creating. And I think that's really important as part of like how I do things. Cause there's like a certain reverence there for like that ancestorship. And then the kind of present thing that I'm doing that I'm creating. And then maybe if nothing comes of this thing that I've made and it becomes something else in the future, then that's something else for someone else to connect to and then add on to. Kind of like keeping up with that history of quilting, which was about like kind of passing it around your community or your family and then finishing it as a, you know, as a unit, except this is kind of like across time, which is like even more like insane to me and really, really special because it's literally like kind of traveling through time as a quilt, but maybe not quite as a quilt, but still a quilt, which is like, you know, <coughs> And really that important. quilt that you cut up didn't start its life as a quilt. Right. It had a story before that. Exactly. There was something that somebody said, and I feel like I'm in a dream today because this is my <laughs> first time in London in over two years and like oh, blessings. <laughs> everything just feels all quite um, unreal. So. I can't remember if it was an earlier conversation with somebody here before we started or on Twitter or in my own head. No, I think it was somebody else. I don't think I had this thought. Was, um, so please speak up if I'm quoting somebody else's words. Um, that all of the conversations somehow spanned both like almost the universal and the very specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that? Was it you, Claire? Yeah. It was Claire, okay. I was, I was questioning myself. Nice, and, that, and I agree, I really, I really felt that. The, the, that's what's nice, I think, about a conversation that can kind of roam quite a long way, um, but kept touching on like real specifics of practice or materials or cloth or needle or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But also like, like that conversation about what does plain mean? Yeah. It was fascinating, like when do you ever stop and think like what does plain mean? What an interesting word. Um, and that, yeah, those, yeah, from the big and like almost universal to the, to the tiny feels um, really quite powerful, I think. I think I agreed with Ecta when she said plain wasn't, wasn't the right word. It was a little bit, I think it ought to be essential sewing. Mm. Mm. Necessary sewing. Depends how you pronounce that word plain. It's just, I'm plain sewing. That's like, you know, I am yeah. elementally, yeah. essentially sewing. I also like how she quite, I think she was like quite tickled by how subversive it is. Yeah. And so I was kind of on the, I was kind of on the side of like, keep the name to keep the subversiveness. <laughs> cause I thought it was quite clever to think, cause I've never thought about plain sewing as like a thing beyond or like not have actively thought about it as a, a thing beyond plain sewing. Cause you know, plain sewing is plain sewing, but it's like how you, I guess how you activate it is where the subversiveness comes in. So maybe it should be like plain, but like in italics or something <laughs> or like in, you know, quotation marks. But I quite like the idea of it just being like, yeah, about like how you pronounce it or like how you engage with it is where the subversiveness comes in instead of like changing the name. Yeah. And we've got 
before I open up to the floor, have you got any more comments? And then you can have questions anyway, but... <laughs> Maybe we're ready for some external yeah. input. Okay, does anybody have a, a question or a reflection or a comment? Um, you were talking about uh, reflective um, stitching. Um, it rem <laughs> Interestingly enough, I actually, I made a film several, well, quite a few years ago, I think about 2014, called Thinking Stitch. Um, and it actually shows two, in, two people embroidering, essentially. Um, and it focuses on that, what's going on in your head, what you're thinking about, how you make the decisions about where you put the next stitch. Um, what, and um, also, one of, my, one of the people in this film, one is Belinda Downs and one is um, Susie Bancroft, they're people that were local. Um, and it's, in particular with Susie, it's, it's a, for her it's a very meditative process, it's something that she does every day and it's sort of, and she talks about her breathing slowing down and when the film is played in a, you know, I've been lucky enough to have it on a proper cinema screen at one, one, in one venue and you can actually hear her breathing as well as the rhythm of the stitching going through. So it's something that I've been very interested in for quite a long time. It sort of comes back and it's something that's actually just recently come up in the discussion about doing some filming with a group that I meet with regularly and we, we've called it Why, it's called Why Stitch. And we've been discussing for the last two or three, three or four years, um, why we stitch. So we have, in-depth conversations about it once about once a month but no resolution as yet so, <laughs> so we, do, we continue with that one but also when you go and and the other thing is about um mending i mean you're talking about repair i'm my i'm working on phd and a lot of the stuff i've been looking at has been um i've been looking at darning and repair in the manufacture of high quality cloth and the skills that are still needed with a needle and a thread and a pair of scissors. So I've been filming um, that form of mending and the skill and the way the hands move and um, visited quite a few workshops, um, just talking to the women, and it is usually women, um, who are hunting through high quality suiting and cloth that would be transformed into billiard table cloth and net um, very different sorts of fabric and different forms of mending. Um, so that's a, you know, so I've been looking at repair from a, it's a sort of uh, a finishing off rather than a, a repair in that sense. So it's making it good, but in the same way, but it's not, it's for a completely different purpose. Um, and I've also filmed um, hand embroidery in Madeira, which is one of those things that is still very much valued and was lucky enough to get into the hills to actually meet the women who feature in their lovely antique pictures for the tourists. But actually those women who are actually making it at home are, are very difficult to sort of find. You get the show bit for the tourists, but actually the people who do it because they need to do it. And the skill that they've got is just extraordinary. Um, and you were, another thing that you were talking about was the, um, the individual hand, everybody's stitching, shows their individual hand. And I've asked that in various sort of settings, but it's the one thing that was very, very predominant in Madeira when they do make great big tablecloths, which will take them a year to stitch, apparently. But they do them sometimes as a group, but one person will do a motif all the way round. They won't do a corner. They'll do a motif because they can tell who stitched what. Right. So, which I found interesting. But you can see the film Thinking Stitch on Vimeo. Yeah. That's great. And I really like your first point about breathing. Yeah. Um, it was something that I was exploring last year. Um, 
Because for some reason, I got really into uh, ASMR. Um, don't, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Um, but yeah, I was really interested in like the, the auditory nature of sewing. Um, so I had a friend of mine attach like these mics to my hands and to um, my stitching and had another friend film it. Um, and yeah, I just sewed. And we like recorded the sound of me stitching. And like a lot of it is my breathing. And a lot of it is like hearing the needle go through the fabric, which is extraordinary. It's like the most, I don't even know how to describe it. Like blissful comes up into my mind, but that sounds a bit weird. But like, it's like very soothing for me. And it was quite, nothing has come of it. It was kind of just like an experiment, but it was like a really special thing to do to kind of like, like how do I document this process in a different way? besides like keeping an artist journal or keeping samples of experiments that I've tried. And so we tried this and it was quite interesting what came of it, like this idea of like capturing the breathing and capturing the motion and capturing the hand in a way that's like recorded as sound. And it was like really special. So we're gonna try it again soon and see how that goes. So like if you're around, <laughs> You know, if you're around Scotland, <laughs> come through. Who, who knew that quietly puncturing something could be so soothing? It's amazing <laughs> sound. Yeah, and at one point, like, because quietly it was really up high, yeah. the sound of the puncture was quite deafening. Yeah. Yeah. And but so we had to re-record because of, like, the sound of the puncture sounded like a bomb going off. <laughs> but, and um, that was really interesting. You can hear it on with the, this, yeah. with the tension. Yeah. Yeah. But it was like an extraordinary sound because it sounds like what it is, but it kind of doesn't because it's so amplified. But it is really interesting. <laughs> I really would love to know from all of you when you're making, how do you know that you're in a state of flow? <laughs> That's it. Ooh. Probably when I forget what I'm doing. Um, maybe like, oh God, I keep coming up with these corny words in my head, like transcendent. Um, but yeah, like, there's a place where I start where I'm very aware of what I'm doing. And I'm like, needle goes in, then it comes out. Then we're gonna to go to the left, then it comes out, and then we're gonna cross, and then we're gonna come out. And then at one point, when I get into a flow, I'm just doing it, and then, yeah, I'm just doing it. And I don't realize it until like hours have gone by and I was supposed to stop, or I've done too much of something and now I have to pull it out because I've gotten into a rhythm where I've kind of lulled myself into like a sort of like hypnotic state, I guess. And it happens a lot with um, embroidery particularly when you're trying to make texture, like little knots and stuff. And once I catch it and I can just do it and then it becomes like, I kind of like hypnotize myself and then it gets to a point where I'm like, um, I don't even know where I am. Like everything kind of like disappears and then it's just me. Like I don't even see the stitching at some point. It's just like me there and I'm just like gone. Inertia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just floating in space. I think I, I would just kind of get, you know, woken out of that state. You know, the dog hasn't been yeah. fed and it's, you know, <laughs> three hours too late for or yeah. whatever, you know, there's no dinner on the table or, you know, whatever. So you almost aren't aware that you're in that, that state of, of working yeah. on whatever you're working like on. Like you don't even hear anything yeah. either. You're yeah. just like mm. somewhere else. For me, the, the 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 um, the transition into it is when the to-do list kind of disappears out yeah. of your head. You know what I mean? I don't think I've properly been in that state since I've had small children, because you can't let your to-do list go for that long. Do you know mm. what I mean? It's uh, yeah, yeah. I, I I think I can um, 
I, I think, yeah, losing track of time, but, but I, I, I agree, Amy, it's hard to, it, I find it hard to actually um, allow myself to get into that state. Yeah. Um, but I know things that help, and that's to do with the materials. So and I, I can tell um, I'm more likely to feel that way if I use a thread that's not going to knock back on itself right. and annoy me. Um, I have a particular kind of needle that I really like. Mm -hmm. So th those things um, kind of contribute the, um, because, because I know that, that that's going to be a smooth experience. So. But yeah, I kind of long for the kind of privilege of having really a lot, of, um, yeah, allowing myself. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think it's the only time I allow myself to do it. Mm. Other times I'm just like freaking out over stuff I haven't done because I'm freaking out over not having done it. And then the list just get longer and longer. And then once I'm stitching, it's just like, okay, nobody died, you're gonna be fine. <laughs> and you're just kind of like, oh. And I find that's the time I get to kind of allow myself to just like breathe for a second mm -hmm. and like not freak out for a second and just like focus on something because I fixate a lot. And it's like kind of taking that fixation and kind of making something constructive out of it instead of just fixating then freaking out over something that really doesn't exist and it's actually fine. And if you take a second, it's actually fine. So when I'm sewing, it's just like I'm realizing working through the thing that I'm freaking out about. I'm like, actually, this is not that deep. And I think stitching helps me do that because I stitch a lot. So it's like, basically, it's great for your mental health is what I'm saying. Highly recommend it. I, I feel like I'm kind of in a moment of flow right now. You know, this <laughs> yeah. is such an enjoyable conversation. You know, and I've been thinking about this up before this event started, and I'll be thinking of it beyond this event. And it's only when, as you've mentioned, kind of external, real-life things have to truncate that that kind of pure, deep pleasure of thinking, um, you know, beyond the act of making as well, which I think is um, is is my experience of flow. So, and I'm sure some of you are probably on the verge of it now as well, getting lost into these gorgeous samplers that you've got in front of you as well. I think for me, sometimes I play music and things, but it's the one is that moment when you get to the quiet. But yeah. sometimes when I find when I really can't, it's, it's not. It's, I'm stitching, but I'm thinking too much about the stitching. I have to close my eyes, then I stitch, mm. and then. It were then, and I'm really, it amazes me what, I don't care what the stitches are when, when I see it, but then I'm always surprised what I've stitched and then, but I need to close my eyes basically. Mm. Strange, but true. <laughs> Anyone else? Can the uh, panel tell us, um, what other people, uh, non-stitchers, ha um, have asked you or wanted a conversation with you whilst you've been stitching um, in public? I get a lot of, can you teach me how to sew? <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, it's just like, I want to I wanna, I wanna do that. I'm like, okay. And then I like, usually I'm very, I'm cool with it. I'm just like, cool, let's, let's do it. I've done it many times because I'm like, you know, I'm very into teaching people things. Like if you wanna know and you wanna take the time, I'll teach you, it's not hard. I think the commitment is where the hard part comes in, where you commit to like creating something. But like sewing itself, I don't think is like hard, but it is time consuming. And some people don't know how to slow down to do it. And I think that's the really interesting part of it when people come up to me and it's like, you just seem so peaceful. It's like, I want to be peaceful. I'm like, OK. <laughs> I don't know if I'm peaceful, but I'll help you out. But yeah, it's a lot of like, can you teach me how to sew? Because I think like, um, I think it was said earlier where it feels like it's something that was dying out, where a lot of people don't know how to simple sew, like sew up a hole or sew on a button. And so yeah, a lot of people are just like, can you teach me how to sew? I get that a lot. 
Go on. Yeah, I think, um, oh, I like that, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> or, what, what's it going to be? That's yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's, it's a long story. So. <laughs> I just had a small point connecting to what Sequoia, Sequoia said. One of my PhD students is a, she teaches design technology in schools. And, you know, a large proportion of those students haven't even seen a hand sewing needle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't yeah. even yeah. know what it is. They, yeah. yeah, they call them pins. Pins, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, let alone what you do with it, you know, is, is quite astonishing. So where do we go from there yeah. um, is a huge challenge, I think. And also sad what they're missing out on, I suppose, yeah. as well. Well, uh, well, I don't actually sew in public. Uh, it's very much a private thing, um, but just following on, uh, I would say perhaps the you know this lost body of collective vocabulary and grammar of sewing. Perhaps the boom in the workshop is taking over that um, that community would have historically you wouldn't you know, I don't think I necessarily learnt to sew ever, but I can certainly remember my mother and my grandmother, it just happened. Mm. And somehow I knew how to do it. Mm. Um, but I think now the interest in workshops, which is phenomenal, is where we are now re relearning those skills. Yeah. I was just going to, sorry, I just wanted to pick up on um, what Claire was saying about what's it for, what's it going to be? So I used to run um, knitting activities at music festivals for quite a few years and it grew over the years. So like the very first time I did it, I just had some yarn and some needles and people knitted some bits and we eventually stitched them together. And I realized that that involved a lot of organizing of like tidying up yarn and needles and a lot of sewing together. So the, I redesigned the activity, it kind of evolved over the years into a, um, a kind of a big knitted web that with all of these bits of knitting, kind of strands of knitting held up with um, like fence posts, temp temporary fence posts in the ground. So it was just this big web with lots of bits coming off it that were kind of knitting in progress. So you would open a bag and you would find some knitting kind of on the go. You could knit for it a bit as long as you wanted to, and then you would tie it back up again and off you go. So it basically didn't require very much facilitation. So it was this big weird thing with these big long strands of quite ropey knitting with some good bits every now and then. Um, and people, mostly people got it. And that's what I really liked was that it didn't need facilitation. People would come and they would look for a minute and they would see that people are knitting. Oh, look, you must do this. You, you start, you can knit for a while. And lovely conversations happened between people as they were sat, you know, with people that they didn't know, but they would start teaching each other or having a chat about whatever. And it was great. But it was generally people who weren't taking part would come up and then say, what is it? What's it going to be? What's it for? And it was like, it's for this? Like this? This, this, this is what it is for. Like, look at all these people sitting here and making and connecting with each other. And, but the, the, like, I guess the, the, the modern, the kind of industrial mindset that everything has to be for something. Like, oh gosh, you're making all these people do all this knitting, it better turn into something useful. Like, no, like, <laughs> but it, it's a space. And yeah, just that kind of urge for things to be useful, I think is a really interesting, a really interesting drive. Like we've got loads of things. I'm pretty sure we don't need any more. Do you think though, kind of when people are learning, having a purpose for it is important. And once they've got over that and through that, they can enjoy it for the process itself. Yeah, I can kind of relate to that, although it, it wasn't the people who were learning that were saying it. It was oh, yeah. a kind of random bystander. Mm. But yeah, I think that, yes, the motivation to mm. have the satisfaction of having made something, mm. I guess, I, uh, there might be a, an element of that in it. Sorry, was there someone else with a question, Carol? It's that moment in Everyone's when in everybody's flow. stitching and it's really <laughs> quiet and, of, and they're concentrating. Maybe it means it's time to draw the panel yes. part to a close. Maybe we need a new cup of tea. I yes. haven't had a cup of tea yet, which no. is... No, we, 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 we misjudged that bit, didn't we? So, and then... 
kind of move to if the, the panel want to spread themselves out around the tables. Um, and anyone, if you want to come and if, if you can drag yourselves away from the stitching you're working on, if you want to come and have a go um, on the stitch table, feel free. Does that sound good? But just like to thank the panel again. So many ideas emerged because not only were we responding to the conversations that have taken place over three weeks, but then you've come up with new ideas and new thinking and, and connecting it to your own personal professional practice. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you.